Alright, welcome back everyone. We are about to start into the book of Leviticus. Uh, cool, I've got it up on my phone as well. Um, so, just a, a bit of a recap here while we're waiting for a few people to get on. Um, the book of Genesis was the book about the beginning of everything. It's very, very important to understand that. But we also have to understand that Moses was the author of Genesis. And his target audience was the Israelite nation. Um, Genesis was written during this, this time period where they're out in the wilderness. They've left Egypt. They haven't got to the promised land yet. So Genesis is being written during this time. It was a 40-year period um, that they were out here. And um, they... Uh, were, were pretty much either traveling or they were out in the wilderness. Uh, wasn't quite desert, but God was providing food for them because food was scarce. And so Moses is, is basically in a tent and he's writing these things down and he's writing to the Israelites. So while Genesis is the beginning of everything, and that is important to understand that, um, I, I firmly believe that Genesis is literal, uh, that the earth is only a few thousand years old, that uh, the, the Bible is not speaking in metaphor at all uh, when we look at Genesis 1 through 11. But I think also, hey Stephen, glad, you're, glad you made it. Um, but uh, Genesis is also the origins of the Israelite nation. Everything up through Genesis 50 is kind of the pre-Israelite. So we start with Adam, the first man, and then we get to Noah, and then we get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is before there was a nation. Exodus is about the the founding of that nation. That's that's a, an, an important word there, because when we get to the New Testament, <clears throat> there is the foundation of the um, the church that is at the cross. The church was founded at the cross. Uh, with the death of the testator according to Hebrews 9. But there was a 40-year period that is echoed, or that is echoing uh, this 40-year period. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 10, where there is a, an establishment period where the church is considered in its infant state and it's receiving the, the law of Christ. And we see that in the writing of the New Testament during that time. Uh, although there were a few... Uh, last books, uh, the the Gospel account of John, the three eponymous letters of John, the book of Jude, but those are all written to an already grown up church. Those are written to a mature church, even though they're considered <clears throat> to be uh, part of the, the divinely inspired group that it, that we call the New Testament. Um, they were not the 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 letters that were written to establish the church. They were written. To an already established church and so <clears throat> what we have in, in in exodus then is the founding of the israelite nation leviticus numbers and deuteronomy are about that establishment period the laws that they were getting from moses from from god uh, that were written on those tablets but god is is talking to moses about them and saying, all right, now is the time to talk to the people about that. And so they're, they're getting these things over that time period. And Moses is writing these things down over that time period. And so that's the establishment period of the Israelite nation. And it's important to, to know that timeline because that timeline is a type for the timeline that we see for the establishment period of the church. And those words founding and establishment, those are two different words. You look in Romans chapter 1, Paul is writing to a congregation at Rome that has already been founded, but he come, he says, I'm, I'm hoping to come to you that I might establish you. So establishing is the building up, is the, is the, the, the scaffolding and everything that brings something into full maturity, um, but is, is not the, the beginning point. Establishing is not a beginning point. And so that's, that's what we looked at with Exodus was the beginning point of Israel, the first year uh, after they left, left Egypt. <clears throat> so now we're in Leviticus, and we're starting to see the rules that were given surrounding the sacrifices and the priesthood. Um, and the, it's, we're going to talk a lot about the, the sins 
that a person could commit under the law of Moses. And I'm going to point out again, this is unto Israel only. And so those who were outside of Israel, a lot of these, these commands specific to Israel did not apply to them and was not a sin uh, to those outside. There were some basic sins that, that they um, were aware of from the tree of knowledge when Adam sinned uh, all the way through Noah. There, there's basic wickedness, things like that, things that are programmed into our consciousness, if you will, uh, to use a computer term or whatever. But <clears throat> those are, are very general, very few, whereas the Israelites had quite a few things that, that they could do in addition uh, to those things that were considered sinful. And I'll bring those up as we come across them. So Stephen says, oh, hey, Tracy, uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, a lot of people coming on. Jeremy, I guess I should look at my phone. Uh, glad to have you guys here. Stephen says, Deuteronomy 29, 13, that he may establish you today as a people for himself and that he may be God to you just as he has spoken to you and just as he has sworn to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exactly so. So that, that idea there uh, towards the end of Deuteronomy, <clears throat> is this idea of, of completing the establishment. So that's what we're doing right now with, with these three books. Is we're, we're moving past that foundational point, that, that beginning of the nation, and now we're going to hopefully grow up the nation into its kind of final form, if you will, uh, as, as God is uh, going to bring them into the promised land. And that, again, is a type. And when we get to that, we will talk more about God bringing the Israelite nation into the promised land. And then how does that correlate to the 40 years of the church wandering in a wilderness of persecution? And what was their promised land? And, and what does that all look like? How do those types match up? But we're not there yet, so I'm not going to I'm not going to jump the gun on that one. All right. So let's get into Leviticus. <clears throat> it should be the, the, the chapters are fairly short and there's only 27 chapters in Leviticus. So uh, if you do find these uh, laborious or torturous, uh, as many do, um, I'm hoping to dispel that with our study, but um, know that Leviticus is relatively short. So, um, And there are some things in here that are extremely controversial too. So maybe we can get some good discussion going on that uh, either here or later on um, with the, the YouTube videos. So Leviticus chapter 1, um, I'll be reading out of the King James, which will be problematic when we get to chapter 2. And um, I'm, I'm looking at probably moving over to the NASB for the more modern English. Um, still, still doing some research on some of those modern translations. There's so much that creeps in to those modern translations uh, that I find problematic. And so the ESV, with all of its Calvinism, I just, I just couldn't stomach um, using it anymore it just was so blatant uh, so uh, I'll, I'll take a look at the NASB and we'll see where that goes all right verse 1 and Jehovah called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation saying so remember if the tabernacle is built this is not the tent that was outside the camp this is actually um, now the tabernacle that has been built and built in that congregation that word congregation there uh, we might look into the New Testament and we might see the word church so this would be the tabernacle of the church, depending on um, the, the way you wanted to translate that word. And so um, this, is, this is the tabernacle. And God's presence is there in the form of this, this cloud and this uh, fiery pillar. And so he's calling to Moses uh, out who Moses is there at the, at the tent, but he is not in the tent. And um, God is speaking to him. And he says, speak unto the children of Israel, not speak to the surrounding nations, not speak to all the people in the future, especially after I send my son, not speak to anybody else, but speak unto the children of Israel. These laws are specific to uh, the, the children of Israel. So the NAS 95 is a great version, highly accurate. Yeah, I definitely want to, I see that I got a lot of preacher friends that, that use it. Um, when they're wanting to go more modern. And so I, I wanted to check it out. Um, but um, again, King James, I'm not King James only, but King James it has errors that I'm familiar with. And so that's why I tend to continue to use it. But I definitely want to find a more modern translation and one that has very few errors, doesn't have the denominational um, tweakings, if you will. The NIV is right out. Um, the... Um, 
and the ESV just I was so disappointed in when I finally got to studying some of the things that it, it taught so uh, but anyway this is these are instructions for the children of Israel and so he says say to them if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord so this is and I, I've highlighted these if any man of you uh, this is the individual that's that's bringing the sacrifice they're highlighted in red is is what the individual does and then highlighted in green down below um, you're gonna see there's a lot about Aaron's sons and the priesthood and stuff although that's not a completely consistent highlighting here so bear with me um, it says if any man of you bring an offering unto Jehovah you shall bring your offering of the cattle even of the herd and of the flock so these are animal offerings that we're talking about in chapter 1 <clears throat> and if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd let him offer a male. Why does it have to be a male? Well, these are typifying Christ. And, and God is going to send his son to be the sacrifice for all the world. And so they have to be a male because of that. Without blemish, again, why without blemish? Because that represents the sinlessness of God's son. When uh, Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was without sin. And that is a, an extremely important point. And so all of this is pointing forward to Messiah. Why is that important for the Israelite nation? Because that is their purpose. The entire purpose of the Israelite nation is to bring the Messiah into the world at the appropriate time. And so um, all of these offerings here have to be the firstlings. Why? Because Jesus was the first fruits. Um, <clears throat> it has to be male. It has to be without blemish. All of these different things are all typifying of what Christ was supposed to be. Um, so this is a, a, the burnt sacrifice, and he shall offer it of his own voluntary will. Again, we get into this idea of free will. Uh, if, if you're a Calvinist and you're reading this, I don't know what you do with this. You know, if, if God's the one that's doing all the programming stuff and you don't have a choice on what you're supposed to be doing in terms of obedience to God, what do you do with verses like this? The, the the burnt sacrifices had to be a free will offering. They had to be something that you wanted to do. And so he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Jehovah. So where is he supposed to do it? He's supposed to do it right there in the courtyard where that altar is. And who's going to do what in terms of this? Because a lot of people, when they hear about this, the priest making the sacrifices and stuff, they they think that the priest did all the work, and that's not true. And I'm going to explain why here in just a minute. So verse 4, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. So he's going to put his hand upon the head of the, of the burnt offering. And what that represents is the, the symbolic, not real, but symbolic transferring of the guilt of sin into the animal. Okay? Weren't these sacrifices designed because of Jesus? In other words, types were determined according to the antitype. Yes, exactly so. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's that's exactly right, Stephen. We God, being omniscient and outside of time, eternal, looks down and and knows the entire timeline, knows all that's going to happen, and designates before he even begins creation, before day one, says, "Son, they're going to sin." And they're going to need you to go down and die for them. And so all of this is because God already knows the future. And the, the types are to teach mankind about the antitypes so that they'll recognize them when the antitypes come along. That's a very good point. It's exactly right. So <clears throat> them putting their hands on the head of the, of the offering, the animal, before it's killed, it's still got to be alive, um, represents them symbolically transferring their sin to this animal, um, and it's going to make atonement for him. That atonement is a, a payment that is made. And note that they have to do this all the time. Every year they're going to have to make this uh, sacrifice because um, the blood of bulls and goats, as Hebrews uh, 9 and 10 says, the, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, not in reality. But what this did is, is sometimes we phrase this as, as it rolled the sins forward or we might talk about the blood of Christ flowing backwards from the cross through time. Um, the idea is, is this was a temporary symbolic uh, act of obedient faith that was a uh, kind of a promissory note. And 
it was a placeholder until they could achieve actual real salvation by the blood of Christ. And so that's why all of this was necessary. All right. So then verse 5, and he shall kill. Who's this? Well, we haven't even mentioned a priest yet. So the he that we're talking about is uh, a male. It's going to be probably the head of the household. Okay, might be an individual, but it could be the head of the household. But it's it's the, the male who is responsible for the family unit. He is the one that brings the offering. It's his offering here in verse 3. It's his offering. And he shall offer it of his own voluntary will. And he shall put his hands upon the head. There's no priest here yet involved. And then he shall kill it. So who kills this creature that is symbolically uh, holding on to his sin? The person that brought the sacrifice. The guy that brings the sacrifice is the one that has to kill it. And what it represents is you destroying your old self destroying your sin you turning your back on your sin and turning towards God is very very powerful he shall kill the bullock before Jehovah and then what do the priests do the priest Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation so you kill it the priests deal with the blood and then, and, and priests here and Aaron's sons is plural. So understand that pronouns have to match in both gender and in number. So priest Aaron's sons is plural. He is a, uh, a, a singular pronoun. Yes, the, the gender matches, and there's only two, but uh, the gender matches, but the number doesn't match. So he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. That's the, he, he, where you, we slice it into small chunks. The guy that killed the animal has to do this. He's the one that's doing all of the cutting up here and destroying that representative of himself and his sin. That's what he is doing. And then in verse 7 it says, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And we'll talk about that fire. That's, that fire is very specific and, and very important. We'll talk about that. Um, but uh, the sons of Aaron... Are gonna, but they're gonna build the fire, and they'll they'll set the wood in the in the proper order, and then it says in verse eight, and the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in the order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar, in a hole in a bucket. In, no, never mind. Uh, so the the sons of Aaron were to take the pieces that the 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 person who brings the offering has cut up the pieces. But they're not allowed to touch that altar. And the priests are the ones that are, are to be around the altar and messing with the altar. Remember, it's got staves to carry just like the Ark of the Covenant. And that ark, or that altar goes with them everywhere the tabernacle goes. And so uh, they handled the fire. Um, and they, they handled the laying of the parts uh, of the animal on the altar. And to, to kind of be crude about it a little bit, it, yes, it's a burnt offering. But a lot of what we're seeing is it, it's it's actually cooking the food for the priesthood. And we're going to see a lot of that, especially down in chapter 2. So this is kind of a barbecue. And, you know, you've ever gone into the, the place and they kind of take a while and you somebody will joke, well, what did you do? You have to go out in the back and kill the cow? And, yeah, that's kind of what they're doing here. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be crass about it, but that's essentially what's happening here is is you've got a guy who brings an offering and there's this spiritual component to it and it's very important. But they're also cooking food that is going to be given to the priesthood and the, and the, the support staff that's the rest of the tribe of Levi because they could not own land and uh, they could not support themselves. The, the whole tribe of Levi was supported by the rest of the nation. And so they don't, they don't get part of the promised land and they have the two half-tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh get a double portion for Joseph um, each representing one of those two, uh, two out of the ten northern tribes because of that. And so Levi doesn't get into a lot of the list because they have a very special place. And the, the rest of the tribe, remember we're over 600,000 uh, people here. Um, the rest of the tribe, or the, or the rest of the Israelite nation, supports the tribe of Levi. And that's, that's part of why there were so many sacrifices that were offered. All right. <clears throat> 
So verse 9, and his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. So this is the guy who's doing the sacrificing. Before he hands it over to the priest, he's got to wash uh, the legs and the, kind of the inward parts of it or whatever, taking, taking out the guts and everything. Uh, all of that's got to be washed in water. And then the priest will burn all of that on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. We'll talk about the fire here in a minute uh, unto, unto Jehovah. So... Uh, they're they're gonna burn these things. Some of it got burnt to ash. The the guts and stuff. A lot of that was just burnt to ash. And there's actually an ash pile that's next to the altar. Um, we'll see about that here when we get to the birds and stuff. But some of it's just cooked, and the priests were to have that. And even though it was um, a an offering to God, we see this in our in our New Testament offering when we offer money and we put it into the collection plate. Yes, it is an offering to uh, God, but what is it used for? It's used for the work of the church. The church uses that. You know, um, a perfect example of this would be uh, somebody who is needy, who's a member of the church, or possibly not, but a member of the church who maybe falls on hard times and needs a little bit of financial support. Then that money is coming from that which has been given to the Lord. And so there's nothing wrong with this. There's there's, no, there's no, nothing wrong with the idea of oh, that's that's supposed to be for God. Well, no, God is doing this specifically um, with purpose in mind. Yes, they have to sacrifice, and, and God accepts that sacrifice for what it is. The, the, the spiritual aspects of all of this are acceptable, but there's also a physical aspect, and that is the nature of the nation of Israel. Is there's, there's a duality here. Is we're dealing with a physical nation. We're dealing with physical sacrifices. We're dealing with all of these things that are types that are all physical anchors for, for helping us understand. But there's also that spiritual aspect. You have people that are 1,600 years before Christ who needed forgiveness of their sins, but there wasn't a Messiah yet. And so that had to be taken care of. Caleb, welcome aboard. So uh, anyway, that's that's where all that kind of comes in together, and I'll try not to belabor that point. And if his offering, again, we're talking about the guy, be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it. And again, a male without blemish, because it represents Christ. And he shall kill it. So it's his offering. He's going to bring it. He's going to kill it. Again, we're not talking about what the priests do. We're talking about what the, what the guy that brings the offering does. On the side of the altar, northward before Jehovah. And then the priest, Aaron's son, shall sprinkle his blood around about, the, around about upon the altar. And then he... Not the priest, not Aaron's sons, but he shall cut it into pieces with his head and his fat. And then the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. Can you imagine this? Every time you come to the sacrifice, you have to kill the sacrifice. And imagine 1,600 years of this being ingrained into your people, into your nation. And then you get to Acts chapter 2, and Peter preaches that sermon... And then Peter tells them, you killed the Lamb of God. You don't think that punches you right in the nose? <laughs> Here they have been for 1,600 years offering these sacrifices where they have to do the killing. Now, of course, there were periods of time where that didn't happen. 70 years of captivity for the southern tribes. And, of course, the northern tribes got taken into Assyrian captivity and stopped altogether. Um, but but the, the part of this where you have to kill your first link where you have to kill the sacrifice and then the messiah comes the perfect lamb of god and you killed him who is taking your sins upon himself man that's that just is mind-blowingly powerful and they didn't get it they 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 didn't get all of this and i have to wonder you know all of this that they participated in had to be willing they had to ha have understood it to some extent and participated in it but then to do this for so long and to not not get it when the time came not to to, to not recognize the anti-type of course when it was laid out for them how many did acts 2 three thousand recognized oh Jesus was the antitype of what we've been doing with these sacrifices all this time. And and they got it finally when it was pointed out to them. And then another 5,000 in Acts chapter 3 and, and, and so many thousands 
after that, uh, all the way up through Acts chapter 10 and then beyond uh, when the Gentiles were added. But that is, that is powerful. You have to do the killing of the sacrifice that's bearing your sins. Mm. That, is, that is tough. All right, but again, verse 13. He shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and then the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Jehovah. Again, you have the fire. And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to Jehovah be of fowls, that's birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons, and the priest shall bring it to, to the altar and wring off his head. So here the priest is doing it. Okay, and the turtle doves and the and the pigeons were were kind of for the poor. Um, we see that uh, in the in the New Testament a little bit too uh, in the gospel accounts. The priest shall bring it to the altar and wring his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar, and then he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers. So the guy has handed back the bird and said, "All right, here you take off the feathers and stuff." And cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. And those ashes are what got consumed in, in entirely. See, what is Stephen saying here? Oh, Americans today would go fetal sipping lattes if they had a gun. In it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. A lot. A lot. There's a lot of us here in the South with, that we've gutted deer. And we've had to do that before. And it's not that big of a deal. But, yeah. There's a lot. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, anyway... <clears throat> So the guy is hung, or he's handed back the bird, and he has to pluck away the crop with the feathers, cast it beside the altar, and uh, on the east part by the place of the ashes, where all of the burnt offerings, anything that gets consumed entirely by the fire, uh, gets kind of shoveled off here. And so these are kind of waste parts, not parts not necessarily. Um, I guess God's not into to wings or whatever. And so, and then he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. So the main part of the bird that's going to be offered is not to be divided or cut up. And uh, part of that we see with Jesus himself. Jesus was not to have any bones broken uh, when, according to prophecy, he was not going to have any bones. We'll, do, we'll get to that in Psalms or whatever. But um, there was this th this idea here that, that um, the, the turtle dove or the, the uh, pigeon was to be left whole after the wings were removed. So the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Jehovah. So let's talk about this fire for a minute. Because <clears throat> this is this is important here with these, with these animal sacrifices. The animal holds the sin of the person in a symbolic fashion. Not really because only Jesus could do that. But in a symbolic fashion, the animal represents the, the sin. And then they are to kill the animal that bears their sin. And then they are to put it into fire. What does is, what is the fire represent? Fire in the Old Testament and the New always, always, always represents judgment against sin. Whenever you read about fire, everybody talks about light the fire and, and uh, uh, you know, let, let the fire of the Holy Spirit consume me. When Jesus talks about that he was going to baptize people or immerse people in water and fire, you don't want any part of the immersion in fire. Because that's a, that's a baptism of judgment against you because of, of you staying in sin. The water is the one you want. The water is where the old man is, is, is destroyed and the new creature comes up and you are now saved, part of the body of the saved. But that judgment of fire, that baptism of fire, you don't want any part of that. Because fire always represents a, a, a condemning judgment. Here, the fire is consuming the the creature that symbolically bears the sin of the person who brought it as an offering and so consuming by fire is very very important they didn't they didn't offer these animals any other way it had to be burned by fire because of the sin and then after the spiritual component is is done with once the type is fulfilled in other words basically after they cooked it that's when the priest could could eat it because it was just food at that point and we see about uh, a little bit about that when Paul talks about um, the meat offered to idols um, in First Corinthians chapter eight. The same thing, because we know that the, the the idols are nothing, and the meat isn't really anything. It's just meat, and so he says it's not a big deal. But if you if you eat it in front of somebody who had a weakness, you could cause some problems. So um, the same the same comparison is here that, that there is a spiritual component, but after all that's done, you know, I was <clears throat> when I was little. 
I was very little, uh, younger than 10. I don't remember exactly how old. Um, we were worshiping in Colleen, Texas. And uh, we would go back in the back and we would help with cleaning up the communion. Well, that's crackers and grape juice and grape juice, man. That's Welch's. That's some good stuff. And so we, you know, um, they were just going to throw it away. And so we would we would eat the crackers and the grape juice. And I remember getting in trouble for that. And uh, it was it was kind of a big deal at the time because I was told that this had been sanctified and this had been this is special. And, you know, at the time I didn't understand. But as I've grown older and I've I've kind of been able to parse through some things here and understand some things. It's just crackers and grape juice. I mean, the Catholics teach tr transubstantiation or whatever, but that's not part of the Bible. They're, they're just symbolic. They're just, the, the, it's the act of worship that makes it important. Yes, we have to eat the unleavened bread. Yes, we have to have the wine. It has to be those specific things. And when we're partaking of them with the congregation as an act of worship, it, it is important to understand what they represent. But when the worship's done, and it's just in the back room, and you're about to toss them in the trash, I mean, there is, it, it, there's no different than what the priests are going to do here. They're going to eat the crackers, and they're going to drink the grape juice. Here, they're going to eat the, the steak that's on the bobby. I mean, that's just, that's just what it is. And so, uh, you know, I... Some people might have a problem with this and be a Romans 14 issue. I would not personally have any issue whatsoever um, with finding the kids back there helping with the Lord's Supper, cleaning it up. And, you know, maybe they take a sip or two from hopefully the ones that haven't been drank out of yet or whatever. But uh, that's, uh, that's that, there's, there's a, a, a correlation that's made here. So anyway... Um, Let's get into uh, Leviticus 2, and we're going to see some of the same things here, but we're going to see one big difference um, with the type of offering that's being made. So uh, let's let's start here in verse 1. This is, when any will offer a meat offering unto Jehovah, his offering shall be a fine flour. What? So this is one of those King James errors. Let's read it again. And when any will offer a meat offering unto Jehovah, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and frankincense thereon. That word meat is uh, the, the way the King James, and it's not an error in the King James so much as it, it's a, a language thing. Meat is a generic word in the early forms of, of modern English to just mean a meal or a food. Um, it's a very generic word. We think of meat as the muscle of animals, um, but meat is, is a different word when the King James is being translated. And if you look in the Greek, there are two words that are important, Ar artos and trophe. Artos is bread, specifically bread, or something made, baked from grains. But trophe is meal. And it's generic, and it can mean bread, it can mean meat, it can mean anything that you consume for physical sustenance. And so that's this word here, the 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 mincha, the mincha I think is how you pronounce it, um, is the word here that's translated as meat, but it's not translated as meat most of the time, and it's only translated as meat in the King James. Uh, in fact, if you look at Leviticus 2, and I have pulled up here basically a comparison to a whole bunch of different translations, New International, Grain Offering, New Living Translation, we don't care about, English Standard, Disappointed in, Grain Offering, uh, don't know that one, New American Standard, Grain Offering, New King James, Grain Offering, um, <clears throat> and then Meat Offering, King James, and then, uh, you know, we go down to a whole bunch of these, and, and one of my favorites when we really get into uh, the technical side is Young's Literal, and he just says, Offering and Present. Okay, these are these are two words here, and if you look, the mincha, gift, tribute, offering, present, gift, present, tribute, offering to God, grain offering, sacrifice, and then oh, it could mean a mean offering, but if you look then, Genesis four three, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. It's the same word, 
and then you read through Genesis, present, gift, present, offering, it's all the same. Okay, so please understand, this is not a contradiction. This isn't a problem that the, the atheists or agnostics or those who would attack the Bible can, can really attack. But you do need to understand, if you're using the King James, that word meat is a general term for food. And so um, we, can, we can continue on. This food offering, or if they want to be really specific about it, a lot of them translate it as a grain offering. I don't think that's accurate. But this food offering, or this, this gift offering unto Jehovah, uh, could be a fine flour, and they're going to pour, pour oil on it. Um, this is different than the uh, sacrificial offerings of the animals in chapter 1. This is a, a different kind of offering. This is a, an additional offering um, that they could give, and this was, again, to support the priesthood. <clears throat> so uh, anything in red, of course, is the guy that's bringing the offering, and then anything in green is going to be the priest or, or uh, Aaron and his son. So, And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof and the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. So he's going to bring this offering. And he's going to take a handful of it. And the priests are going to burn the memorial. That, that word memorial there is uh, the symbolic representation of the whole. Because the rest of it was going to be given to the priests. The, the whole offering was going to be given to the priests. But a small portion of it was going to be burnt on the altar. Uh, on the altar. Uh, and it's going to end up being turned into ash and, and not used at all. <clears throat> uh, and here in verse 3, it says that. Uh, and the remnant, okay, that's the part that's not the memorial. The memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Jehovah. But the remnant of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of Jehovah made by fire. So... Uh, very, very important that we understand that distinction. And the, everything here in highlighted in blue is just me saying, hey, it's not muscle of animal that we're talking about. And so if you bring an oblation of, of a, a, I'm going to say meal instead of meat. I'm going to auto-translate this, um, but I'm just going to call it a meal offering. If you uh, bring an oblation of a meal offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. So what is this pointing to? This is pointing to the unleavened bread that we partake of uh, as part of the New Testament, the taking of the Lord's Supper. Okay, so that it it had to be unleavened wafers. Uh, so if if your oblation be a meal offering baked in a pan, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mingled with oil. You shall part it in pieces and pour oil thereon. It is a meal offering. And if your oblation be a meal offering baked in a frying pan, it shall be made of fine flour with an oil. Uh, and you shall bring the meal offering that is made of these things unto Jehovah. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. So most of the work is done by the individual doing the sacrifice. And then you bring it to the priest and the priest gets to put it on the altar. And the priest shall take from the meal offering a memorial, that's the, the small portion of, and shall burn it on the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Jehovah, and that which is left of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of Jehovah made by fire. So, again, this is the support of the priesthood by bringing these things to give thanks to God for all of the things that he's given to them, but also to help support this tribe that was not allowed to have any land in the promised land. No meal offering which you shall bring unto Jehovah shall be made with leaven, why not? Again, it's a type pointing to the New Testament uh, Lord's Supper that we're taking. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in the offering of Jehovah made by fire. I'm not sure yet on the honey. Uh, Stephen may know, others may know. Um, I want to say that it's because honey has a leavening effect. Uh, when, you, when you cook things with honey, you tend to have this leavening effect because of the nature of honey. Uh, but I don't know that for sure. That's something that I, I didn't have, um, I, I couldn't find specifics on. Uh, and so I, I need to kind of research that a little bit more, why they couldn't use honey. But my, my hypothesis is, is because honey uh, has a nature to it that it has a leavening effect as well. Um, and they were going to be going to a land flowing with milk and honey. So um, 
the the idea here is that, that uh, they were not to have any kind of anything that kind of poofed up the bread. And part of that is because when you do that, when you put leaven in a bread, <coughs> it doesn't preserve as well. It doesn't last as long. Um, it can go moldy. It can it can get bad. But <coughs> if you don't put any leaven in it, leaven is a, a, a yeast. It's a it, it's its own kind of uh, bacterial thing. And so don't put don't put any leaven in it. It's going to last longer. And so the priest would have access to that for longer. All right, verse 12, and as for the oblation of the first fruits, um, this, this word is, is kind of generic, but it's also talking now about like fruits and vegetables. You shall offer them unto Jehovah, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. So if you're if, going back to Genesis 4 and verse 3, which I even pulled that up here. In the process of time, to, uh, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground um, and this wasn't the first fruits. There wasn't anything special. We talked about that when we went through Genesis 4. But the, to bring you the fruit of the, the ground, uh, that's an acceptable sacrifice to God. We're showing that right now, that you can bring a fruit and vegetable offering to God, and he will accept it. Cain's problem was is that he didn't bring the first fruits. He didn't bring the best, whereas Abel brought the best. Um, and so... Uh, the sacrifice here is when you bring the fruits and vegetables, you know, cooking fruits and vegetables, some of the, the fruits, especially, you know, cook a plum on a, on a stove, probably not going to have the same effect nutritionally. And so those were not, um, the, the, the fruits and the vegetables were not um, burnt on the altar. They were offered to God, but they were not burnt on the altar. On, on the altar. Verse 13, and every oblation of your meal offering shall you season with salt, uh, neither shall there suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from your meal offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Um, this idea of salt is the, the uh, uh, representation of the, uh, the gospel, the, the message that's being sent, that, that everything needs to be tempered by the gospel. We'll, we read a lot about salt in the new testament uh, uh you know you are the salt of the world uh, if the salt has lost its flavor those kinds of things uh the idea of salt is is the, the uh, everything needed to be done according to the will of god is a representation of god's message to man and so uh, that's where the salt comes in it has to be on everything so the priest had a very high salt diet <laughs> Uh, and if you offer a meal offering of your first fruits unto Jehovah, you shall offer for the meal offering of your first fruits green ears of corn, dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. So they could have it uh, either on the cob or not. And it had to be dried by the fire. It was not cooked in the fire. Um, and you shall put oil upon it. Um, we might think of like kind of like butter. And lay frankincense thereon. It is a meal offering. And the priest shall burn them. And remember, this is everything that the guy had to do. Um, and then the priest shall burn the memorial or the portion of the corn uh, because corn is a grain. Uh, remember, fruits and vegetables were not to be burned, but corn is a grain. Um, and so they, they could burn a portion of it, the memorial part of it, uh, what we would call the symbolic part of it or representative part of it. And then part of the beaten corn thereof and part of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. And it is an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. Again, the fire representing uh, God's judgment. Uh, against sin so uh, that's it first two chapters of Leviticus are in the can um, I hope this has been interesting I, I don't want Leviticus to be what I was raised probably through a lot of media more than anything hearing that Leviticus was boring it was repetitious um, and I didn't get as much of the, the, the deep meaning of this book that I wish I, I would have gotten as a, as a, maybe a high schooler. As a little kid, not necessarily appropriate, but, you know, as a high schooler or whatever, I would have loved to have, have had a lot more of this um, or congregations that I was uh, working with when I was in college or something like that. I just didn't ever hear anything from the Old Testament, hardly, um, except for when my dad was, was teaching. If my dad was teaching a class, of course, we, we spent a good portion of my high school time studying Revelation, um, and that requires you to go back to the Old Testament to understand. So I got a lot of it there. I just didn't, I, I never got like a, a whole overarching uh, understanding of the Old Testament like I would like. 
and so a lot of this is just um, from personal study and stuff and I hope that it's been meaningful to you I hope that it's it's had the potency of scripture to you that the New Testament has for so many of us um, and I hope you'll be back for more so thank you for being here um, a good 45 minute lesson two chapters in 45 minutes is pretty good um, especially going through things like Leviticus um, I hope to continue uh, for the rest of the week get a few chapters in um, we could finish we could finish up uh, Leviticus um, in two to three weeks if I get to keep going depending on what's going on I am going back to work on um, the 7th of August and I'm not sure what that's going to do to my timetable, uh, especially if I'm going to work. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to have the same frequency uh, that I've had before, and I doubt I'll have the same time slot for it. So we'll just have to see uh, what we can do when we get around to that. I'll have to put some time and thought into that. But until then, I'm hoping to do this uh, pretty much every day and get as far as I can into Leviticus until that time comes. Thank you for joining. If you did get something out of this, hopefully you'll share it um, and you will um, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, if you need to go back and reference any of this stuff. So y'all have a wonderful day and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.